This is a lecture by Ernst Mach. It's called The Part Played by Accident in Invention and Discovery. It is characteristic of the naive and sanguine beginnings of thought in youthful men and nations that all problems are held to be soluble and fundamentally intelligible on the first appearance of success. The sage of Miletus on seeing plants take their rise from moisture believed he had comprehended the whole of nature and he of Samos on discovering that definite numbers corresponded to the lengths of harmonic strings imagined he could exhaust the nature of the world by means of numbers philosophy and science in such periods are blended wilder experience however speedily discloses the error of such a course gives rise to criticism and leads to the division and ramification of the sciences at the same time the necessity of a broad and general view of the world remains and to meet this need philosophy parts company with special inquiry it is true the two are often found united in gigantic personalities but as a rule their ways diverge more and more widely from each other and if the estrangement of philosophy from science can reach a point where data unworthy of the nursery are not deemed too scanty as foundations of the world on the other hand the thorough paced specialist may go to the extreme of rejecting point blank the possibility of a broader view or at least of deeming it superfluous forgetful of Voltaire's apothem nowhere more applicable than here la superfluo très nécessaire it is true the philosophy the history of philosophy owing to the insufficiency of its constructive data is and must be largely a history of error but it would be the height of ingratitude on our part to forget that the seeds of thoughts which still fructify the soil of special research such as the theory of irrationals the conceptions of conservation the doctrine of evolution the idea of specific energies and so forth may be traced back in distant ages to philosophical sources furthermore to have deferred or abandoned the attempt at a broad philosophical view of the world from a full knowledge of the insufficiency of our materials is quite a different thing from never having undertaken it at all the revenge of its neglect moreover is constantly visited upon the specialist by his committal of the very errors which philosophy long ago exposed as a fact in physics and physiology particularly during the first half of this century are to be met intellectual productions which for naive simplicity are not a jot inferior to those of the iconian school or to the platonic ideas or to that much reviled ontological proof latterly there has been evidence of a gradual change in the situation recent philosophy has set itself more modest and more attainable ends it is no longer inimical to special inquiry in fact it is zealously taking part in that inquiry on the other hand the special sciences mathematics and physics no less than philology have become imminently philosophical the material presented is no longer accepted uncritically the glance of the inquirer is bent upon 
neighboring fields once that material has been derived. The different special departments are striving for closer union and gradually the conviction is gaining ground that philosophy can consist of only of mutual complemental criticism, interpretation and union of the special sciences into a consolidated whole as the blood in nourishing the body separates into countless capillaries only to be collected again and to meet in the heart so in the science of the future all the rills of knowledge will gather more and more into a common and undivided stream it is this view not an unfamiliar one to the present generation that i purpose to advocate entertain no hope or rather fear that I shall construct systems for you. I shall remain a natural inquirer, nor expect that it is my intention to skirt all the fields of natural inquiry. I can attempt to be your guide only in that branch which is familiar to me, and even there I can assist in the furthermore of only a small proportion of the allotted task. If I shall succeed in rendering plain to you the relations of physics, psychology, and the theory of knowledge, so that you may draw from each profit and light, redounding to the advantage of each. I shall regard my work as not having been in vain, therefore to illustrate by an example how constant, constantly, consonantly with my powers and views, I conceive such inquiries should be conducted. I shall treat today in the form of a brief sketch of the following special and limited subject of the part which accidental circumstances play in the development of inventions and discoveries. When we Germans say of a man that he was not the inventor of gunpowder, we impose Plidedly cast a grave suspicion on his abilities, but the expression is not a felicitous one, as there is probably no invention in which deliberate thought had a smaller and purer luck, a larger than in this. It is well to ask, are we justified in placing a low estimate on the achievement of an inventor because accident has assisted him in his work huggins whose discoveries and inventions are justly sufficient to entitle him to an opinion in such matters lays great emphasis on this factor he asserts that a man capable of inventing the telescope without the concurrence of accident must have been gifted with superhuman genius a man living in the midst of Civilization finds himself surrounded by a host of marvelous inventions, considering none other than the means of satisfying the needs of daily life. Picture a man transported to the epoch preceding the invention of these ingenious appliances and imagine him undertaking in a serious manner to comprehend their origin. At first, the intellectual power of the men capable of producing such marvels will strike him as incredible, or, if we adopt the ancient view, as divine. But his astonishment is considerably allayed by the disenchanting yet elucidative revelations of the history of primitive culture, which to a large extent prove that these inventions took their rise very slowly and by imperceptible degrees. A small hole in the ground with fire kindled in it constituted the primitive stove. The flesh of the quarry, wrapped with water in its skin, was boiled by contact with heated stones. Cooking by stones was also done in wooden vessels. Hollow gourds were protected from the fire by coats of clay. Thus, from the burned clay accidentally originated the enveloping pot, which rendered the gourd superfluous. 
although for a long time thereafter, the clay was still spread over the gourd, or pressed into woven wicker work before the potter's art assumed its final independence. Even then, the wicker work ornament was retained as a sort of a test of its origin. We see thus it is by accidental circumstances and by such as lie without our purpose, foresight, and power that man is gradually led to the acquaintance of improved means of satisfying his wants. Let the reader picture to himself the genius of a man who could have foreseen without the help of accident that clay handled in the ordinary manner would produce a useful cooking utensil. The majority of the inventions made in the early stages of civilization, including language, writing, money, and the rest, could not have been the product of deliberate methodical reflection for the simple reason that no idea of their value and significance could have had except from practical use. The invention of the bridge may have been suggested by the trunk of a tree which had fallen athwart a mountain torrent, that of the tool by the use of a stone accidentally taken into the hand of crack nuts. The use of fire probably started in and was disseminated from regions where volcanic eruptions, hot springs, and burning jets of natural gas afforded opportunity for quietly observing and turning to practical account the properties of fire. <sighs> Only after that had been done could the significance of the fire drill be appreciated, an instrument which was probably discovered from boring a hole through a piece of wood. The suggestion of a distinguished inquirer that the invention of the fire drill originated on the occasion of a religious ceremony is both fantastic and incredible. And as to the use of fire, we should no more attempt to derive that from the invention of the fire drill than we should from the invention of sulfur matches. Unquestionably, the opposite course was the real one. Similar phenomena, though still largely veiled in obscurity, mark the initial transition of nations from a hunting to a nomadic life and to agriculture. We shall not multiply examples, but content ourselves with the remark that the same phenomena recur in historical times, in the ages of great technological inventions, and further that, regarding them, the most whimsical notions have been circulated, notions which ascribe to accident an unduly exaggerated part, and one which, in a psychological respect, is absolutely impossible. The observation of steam escaping from a tea kettle and of the clattering of the lid is supposed to have led to the invention of the steam engine. Just think of the gap between this spectacle and the conception of the performance of great mechanical work by steam for a man totally ignorant of the steam engine. Let us suppose, however, that an engineer versed in the practical construction of pumps should accidentally dip into water an inverted bottle that had been filled with steam for drying and still retained its steam. He would see the water rush violently into the bottle, and the idea would very naturally suggest itself of founding on this experience a convenient and useful atmospheric steam pump, which by imperceptible degrees, both psychologically possible and immediate, would then undergo a natural and gradual transformation into Watt's steam engine. But, Granting that the most important inventions are brought to man's notice accidentally and in ways that are beyond his foresight, yet it does not follow that accident alone is sufficient to produce an invention. The part which man plays is by no means a passive one. Even the first potter in the primeval forest must have felt some stirrings of genius within him. 
In all such cases, the inventor is obliged to take note of the new fact. He must discover and grasp its advantageous feature and must have the power to turn that feature to account in the realization of his purpose. He must isolate the new feature, impress it upon his memory, unite and interweave it with the rest of his thought. In short, he must possess the capacity to profit by experience. The capacity to profit by experience might well be set up as a test of intelligence. This power varies considerably in men of the same race and increases enormously as we advance from the lower animals to man. The former are limited in this regard almost entirely to the reflex actions which they have inherited with their organism. They are almost totally incapable of individual experience and considering their simple wants are scarcely in need of it. The ivory snail, Eberna spirata, never learns to avoid the carnivorous actinia no matter how often it may wince under the latter's shower of needles, apparently having no memory for pain whatever. A spider can be lured forth repeatedly from its hole by touching its web with a tuning fork. The moth plunges again and again into the flame which has burnt it. The hummingbird hawk moth dashes repeatedly against the painted roses of the wall plot wallpaper like the unhappy and desperate thinker who never wearies of attacking the same insoluble chimerical problem as aimlessly almost as Maxwell's gaseous molecules and in the same unreasoning manner common flies in their search for light and air stream against the glass pane of a half opened window and remain there from sheer inability to find their way around the narrow frame but a pike separated from the minnows of his aquarium by a glass partition learns after the lapse of a few months, though only after having butted himself half to death, that he cannot attack these fishes with impunity. What is more, he leaves them in peace, even after the removal of the partition, though he will bolt a strange fish at once. Considerable memory must be attributed to birds of passage, a memory which, probably owing to the absence of disturbing thoughts, acts with the precision of that of some idiots. Finally, this susceptibility to training evinced by the higher vertebrates is indisputable proof of the ability of these animals to profit by experience. A powerfully developed mechanical memory which recalls vividly, faithfully old situations is sufficient for avoiding definite particular dangers or for taking advantage of definite particular opportunities. But more is required for the development of inventions. More extensive chains of images are necessary here. The excitation of mutual contact of widely different trains of ideas, a more powerful, more manifold and richer connection of the contents of memory. Pardon me. But more is required for the development of inventions. More extensive chains of images are necessary here. The excitation by mutual contact of widely different trains of ideas, a more powerful, more manifold and richer connection of the contents of memory, a more powerful and impressionable psychical life heightened by use. A man stands on the bank of a mountain torrent, which is a serious obstacle to him. He remembers that he has crossed just such a torrent before on the trunk of a fallen tree. Hard by trees are growing. 
He has often moved the trunks of fallen trees. He has often felled trees before and then moved them to fell trees. He has used sharp stones. He goes in search of a stone. And as the old situations that crowd into his memory are held there in living reality by the definite, powerful interest which he has in crossing just this torrent, as these impressions are made to pass before his mind in the inverse order in which they were here evoked he invents the bridge. There can be no doubt but the higher invertebrates adapt their actions in some moderate degree to circumstances. The fact that they give no appreciable evidence of advance by the accumulation of inventions is satisfactorily explained by a difference of degree or intensity of intelligence as compared with man. The assumption of a difference of kind is not necessary. A person who saves a little every day, be it ever so little, has an incalculable advantage over him who daily squanders that amount, or is unable to keep what he has accumulated. A slight quantitative difference in such things explains enormous differences of advantage. The rules which hold in prehistoric times also hold good in historical times, and the remarks made on invention may be applied almost without modification to discovery, for the two are distinguished solely by the use to which the new knowledge is put. In both cases, the investigator is concerned with some newly observed relation of new or old properties, abstract or concrete. It is observed, for example, that a substance which gives a chemical reaction A is also the cause of a chemical reaction B. If this observation fulfills no purpose but that of furthering the scientist's insight or of removing a source of intellectual discomfort, we have a discovery, but an invention. If in using the substance, giving the reaction A to produce the desired reaction B, we have a practical end in view and seek to remove a source of material discomfort. The phrase disclosure of the connection of reactions is broad enough to cover discoveries and inventions in all departments. It embraces the Pythagorean proposition, which is a combination of a geometrical and an arithmetical, arithmetical reaction. Newton's discovery of the connection of Kepler's motions with the law of the inverse squares as perfectly as it does the detection of some minute but appropriate alteration in the construction of a tool or of some appropriate change in the methods of a dying establishment. The disclosure of new provinces of facts before unknown can only be brought about by accidental circumstances under which are remarked facts that commonly go unnoticed. The achievement of the discoverer here consists in his sharpened attention which detects the uncommon features of an occurrence and their determining conditions from their most evanescent marks and discovers means of submitting them to exact and full observation. Under this head belong the first disclosures of electrical and magnetic phenomena, Grimaldi's observation of interference, Arago's discovery of the increased check suffered by a magnetic needle vibrating in a copper envelope as compared with that observed in a bandbox, Foucault's observation of the stability of the plane of vibration of a rod accidentally struck while rotating in a turning lathe, Mayer's observation of the increased redness of Venus blood in the tropics, Kirchhoff's, Kirchhoff's observation of the augmentation of the D line in the solar spectrum by the interposition of a sodium lamp, Schobein's discovery of ozone from the phosphoric smell emitted on the disruption of air by electric sparks and a host of others, all these facts, of which unquestionably many were seen numbers of times before they were noticed, are examples of the inauguration of momentous discoveries by accidental circumstances and place the importance of strained attention in a brilliant light. 